All right, this, this is a reference to uh, his 1966 uh, single under David Bowie in the lower third, Can't Help Thinking About Me. Posing, as queer musicologist Judith Pereno notes, refers to the body's orientation or position in space and or to its behavior, pejoratively read as inauthentic at best and as a form of cultural theft at worst. David Bowie posed extravagantly in both senses. He, his legacy, is as the consummate poseur. While Pereno uh, reads his um, refusal to engage with the deeper meanings and cultural freight of sexuality and offer instead a sexuality of the surface, whereby sex was not psychology, not a way of life, not a politics, but an art of posing, I argue that Bowie's art of the poseur compulsively and continuously thinking about himself indeed w was not all of these things and instead was calculated, if not exactly cynical, deeply masculinist, which is to say irredeemably heterosex heterosexual, a surface facade facing always already lived queer lesbian materialities not so much inauthentic, think of his generosity with at least Iggy Pop and uh, Lou Reed and the gesture with Klaus Nomi, but <laughs> constantly reflecting himself. I make these claims in reference to 1970s clam rock, glam rock, not clam, but glam. <laughs> which I further argue engaged its own art of the poseur that simultaneously legitimated straight men, such as Bowie, posing gay, and delegitimated lesbians living out, composing and performing their music and in an erased parallel universe, all of which opened uh, conceptual and social space for the phenomenon of the straight queer, of the so-called lesbian chic 1990s, when lesbians, according to Laura, Cott Laura Cottingham, were not really lesbians at all. Okay, you never know if this is going to work out. And that tells me look, the animation didn't come through. It's okay. Uh, Bowie, and uh, as you no doubt know, Mark Bolin are credited with pioneering glam rock in England early in the 70s, where it was a veritable movement due in part to a long history of cross-dressing in British popular entertainment. In addition to its roots in British musical theater, glam may be further read as an extension of 19th century dandyism associated with Beau Brummel and Oscar Wilde, thus homosexual, and is valorized today, of course, for its so-called gender bending. While cross-dressing and sexual ambiguity might have been acceptable in England then, and by comparison, they were, uh, but not so in North America, where glam was a niche genre, even in the context of Bowie's unparalleled success. Glam historians argue that Bowie, and to a much lesser extent other glam performers, became popular in the US in part as a function of pop's post-Woodstock mood. Psychedelic rock was exhausted, the argument goes, due to the self-absorption of lead guitars who turned their backs to the audience while performing excessive and extended solos. And of course, <laughs> the increasingly irrelevance of hippie counterculture. Now, 1960s rocks was exceedingly heterosexual and sexist, and the androgyny for which male hippies were known extended only as far as clothing and hairstyle. By comparison, the feminized personae and the theatricality, theatricality of glam rock rendered glam musicians sexually attractive to both straight women and gay men. As performers styled glam in ways that Auslander describes as playing homosexual to its assertively hetero predecessor. By conforming to the conventions of male-dominated heterosexual rock, however, glam also attracted an audience of straight men. And the genre eventually devolved or moved on, you could say, to um, hypermasculine heterosexual punk rock. Um, so fashion or hair metal bands uh, like uh, the New York Dolls, like Kiss, for them, 
dressing up like a girl, Martha Bales argues, was a function of anger expressed by macho defiance as an ultimate act of rebellion that simultaneously proved their masculinity and heterosexual pro uh, prowess also drove their fathers crazy. It's one thing to be, be rebellious, it's quite another to do it while you're wearing a dress, <laughs> makeup, and screwing as many girls as you can find. <laughs> and they talk about this at great length. Brian Eno even says, I can't believe how many more girls I have by doing this. <laughs> In this context, with, here we are, American glam artists and supporters apparently in the throes of homosexual panic, insisting that any tendency to dress lavishly and use makeup should not be taken as signs of sexual ab abnormality, glam rock itself embodied the art of the poseur. Driven by the force of musicians' multiple uh, musical in inclinations, um, Glam was neither orally nor visually monolithic, and Bowie, of course, is the poster child for that. The most prolific innovator, brilliant, genius, experimenting with sound special effects, I don't have to tell you this, creating and discarding multiple personae in a variety of visual er, artistic genres. So in a 1971 interview, oh, looks like it might work here. Um, Boy positioned his performances as explicitly theatrical for himself as well as for his audience. Try to imagine that baritone British accent. I can't do it. I don't, I don't want to climb out of my fantasies, he said, in order to go up on stage. I want to take them with me. Further committing himself to the art of poseur, Bowie insisted that music should be tarted up, made into a prostitute, a parody of itself. And in the end, the inherently unserious theatrical art of the poseur constituted Glam's ultimate transgression against so-called serious rock. Poseur, as Pereno explains, consume rather than produce, imitate rather than originate. They are, she says, derivative, shallow, and passive. As such, they are always already feminized which was exactly the criticism leveled at glam rock generally and Bowie specifically during the 70s. Yes, some people did criticize him. That complaints about glam were more about sexism and homophobia than they were about music isn't unexpected. But nor did it act as a catalyst for resistance to sexism and homophobia by glam rock musicians, remember male and heterosexual, even if they might have occasionally slept with other men as a function of, oh, I don't know, drugs, <laughs> general euphoria, narcissism, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Married to Angela at the time, a good relationship by his own account, and father to son, son Zoe, Bowie, a self-described cosmic yob, shunned all politics, just as sex, recalling Pereno, became both a product and a politics mm, for women, as it happens. Bowie specifically, as you no doubt know, distanced himself from so-called gay liberation in 1972, even um, as he claimed to be gay, always have been, and then you know, almost immediately backtracked to bisexual not to put too fine a point on it. He released Ziggy Stardust in, uh, Stardust in that same year, 1972, the year that uh, butch lesbian Maxine Feldman, who was Max when he died in 07, um, actually recorded Angry Athis. Uh, she wrote it in 1969, couldn't get it recorded until 72. She wrote it three months before the Stonewall riots um, in a creative burst of anger that reads to me as very similar to Nina Simone's rage that fueled her compositional process for Mississippi Goddamn in 1963. As you no doubt know, Bowie retracted his claim of homosexuality in 1983. I was so young, he said. The same year, of course, he uh, released Let's Dance. And lesbian musicians Meg Christian and Chris Williamson released Meg and Chris at Carnegie Hall, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the founding of Olivia Records, one of the first and certainly largest 
independent women's labels. So this is just to give you a sense of that parallel, um, abject, illegible universe that was going on throughout lesbians at the exact same time. These uh, artists were all signed by Olivia Records. The, the certainly, I think, the greatest songwriter of this time uh, was never signed by Olivia. She was Canadian. Fair. Uh, yeah, her music, brilliant, made Katie Lang possible, in my estimation, and um, is living in poverty in rural Michigan, living there to be near the, uh, the uh, Michigan very famous women's music festival. Um, these lesbians, musicians, earned their livings by performing at women's music festivals. And my point is that Waboli and other, mu other straight men were posing queer in their music and personae. Lesbian musicians and others, like Farron, were living and expressing queer in their music and lives. So I argue that this dabbling in homosexuality in the 1970s constituted examples of straight appropriation of queerness as a signifier of hipness, the effect of which contained homosexuality, at least for out lesbians. That now everyone wants to be queer renders queer straight. The concept of the straight queer, what Ann Powers calls, and I really quite love this, that testy love child of identity politics and shifting sexual norms. The straight queer emerged in the lesbian chic 1990s, when lesbians were okay, I guess, as a signifier for heterosexuals intent upon so-called edginess, who deployed queer signs which they then were naturalized by heterosexual signs, thus recuperating the ideological dominance of heteronormative culture. Stan Hawkins describes the straight queer as urban, bold, postmodern, can be sexually transgressive, um, but challenging everything, sexual or otherwise, considered to be proper. As an all-purpose signifier of transgression, straight queer deploys a romantic construction of the artist, Emma Mayhew says, um, an outsider situated in a so-called queer artistic nexus. Musicians, as a function of their deviance in Western society generally, and rock musicians in particular, with their position as uh, rebel and provocateur, are given artistic license and freedom to pursue taboo subjects and to behave outside the norm. Having everything to do with generalized transgression and nothing to do with queer politics, however, the effect of straight queer musicians is to heterosexualize the music industry, even as they present themselves as vaguely gay. Now, since the 90s, it has become really great to be out, right? Pink, however, <laughs> comments, who is not gay, right? Without apparent irony, says, I should be gay by the way that I look and the way that I am. I just happen to not be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As she takes ownership of her adorable little gay girl couples and gay boys. Um, you might think of uh, Gaga in this sense, too. But like the so-called white Negro of the 1950s, white people who wanted to be black, Straight performers who queer around communicate that they are straight queer, which is to say really straight. And this is neither innocent nor without consequences. What are implications involved in claiming queerness when you're not gay or lesbian? Would we tolerate this if we were talking about race? If it's colonizing for a white person to claim blackness, and you remember perhaps the, uh, the kerfuffle over the uh, black, or actually white woman, who presented herself as black um, and lost her job as a result. Uh, if that's a problem, why is it so strangely legitimate for a heterosexual to claim queerness? So I, this is the end. I would suggest that a, a perhaps unintended legacy 
constructing queerness in order to define straightness disembodies musicians rather more literally than David Bowie could have posed and Philip Brett could have imagined with his now famous declaration, famous if you're a musicologist. <laughs> All musicians, he said, we must remember are faggots. <laughs> I would suggest, and, or dice. Thank you.